saying? Ask you this morning as we come to you in prayer that you be with us and that we have a repentant heart and mind that our prayer that you heard at this time, that you will continue to watch over each and every last one of us here at the church. Continue to be with us during this morning's Bible class that you will be with Brother Patrick as he goes through the lessons with us, that you will keep him in the room for the things he has studied, that we will apply these things to our lives. Be with those who can make it here this morning, that you will watch over them.
interessas já está em pé. Cabe do outro Estado, do outro Império, e já de outras pessoas para. Paul talks about that. Um, Paul says that uh, we, we might have a spouse that isn't faithful uh, to God, but if we are obedient to God, we might turn our spouse. We might convert our spouse. We don't know. Uh, so we need to continue to be faithful to God. Yes? Well, side note on that, and I agree with you totally on everything you said. Uh, God first. Sometimes, and I, and I don't have this problem, but you know, someone might have a spouse who thinks that anything they want to be above any other thing is most important. God gave us duties and responsibilities and many things, and we cannot concentrate on one and leave everything else undone. I mean, we, we have duties and obligations to perform. Someone says, well, I, you have a duty to do this. Well, you obviously have other duties give them 100% of everything that you've got. God gave you duties and responsibilities to him and his fellow man, your fellow man, and everything. So that's something that could be virtually used if we grow. Right. That's a good point. And so we have to remember that all these other things are second. But God is first. And so if we put God first, then that's where faith comes in. If we truly believe in God, that's where our faith comes in. And it's not just, I believe in God. It's an obedient faith. If we truly believe in God, we're going to obey Him, and we're going to do the things that He has told us to do, and that's where works comes in. We'll get into the relationship between faith and works later on. But the first thing that we need to discuss is the first point that the writer gets into here, which is we are saved through faith. We are saved through faith. And Paul tells us that, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. The problem is, how are we saved through grace and through faith? Well, the grace of God brought us the death of Jesus, his only son. Um, it was by grace that he sent Jesus to die on the cross. We know that. We have to. We have to admit that. While we were yet sinners, and there are some denominations that teach that that was only for specific people, but God says that was for who? For all men, all people, right? It was extended to all. Um, here, this verse says, "For by grace are ye saved through faith." Well, James chapter 2 tells us what kind of faith that is. That's by works. And so it's an obedient type of faith, which again we'll get into. And we have several examples. Hebrews 11 verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. We have to have that faith. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we know we have to have Again, it's coupled with obedience. And there it happens to be baptism. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So, again, we know we have to have faith. The Ethiopian eunuch confessed his faith. What was his confession? Uh, Peter said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said he had to have faith before he could even be baptized. Best, right? So faith is very important. We don't deny it. If we deny that we have to have faith, then we're denying the scriptures. Because God says we have to have faith. So uh, there are two types of faith. There is a dead faith, and there's a living faith. And we see so many in the world today that have a dead faith. This is a type of faith that somebody says, I believe. But then they do what? They don't know that. Right? Uh, what's, uh, what's a perfect example? Let's go to James chapter 2. Let's turn to James chapter 2. And here we have an example. And 
we know of some in the world today that follow after this example. James chapter 2, and Steve, could you read verses 17 through 19? So at verse 26, Chris, could you read verse 26 of James chapter 2, please? For as the Bible is not the Spirit stand, so faith is not the Lord's Spirit stand also. And so here he's liking the body without the Spirit being dead. Faith without works is dead. But we have that living faith. Hebrews 11, the entire chapter, talks about specific examples of people that did obey God in their faith. Uh, the writer in this lesson calls them the honor roll of Old Testament characters. Like I've said before, I don't really like to call them characters because that gives us the impression that the Bible is just a storybook. And the Bible is not a storybook. They were actual people. They were people that are lessons of historic events and so I like to call them the honor roll of the faithful or the hall of the faithful that gives us a little bit better uh, idea of what it was but every single time 
And let's just go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to read all the way through this because we don't have the time for it. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll just look at a couple of examples here. And every time that we look through here at these examples, we'll start with uh, verse 7. We have, by faith, Noah, and he does something. He acts on his faith. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham. And if we go down to towards the end of that, he obeyed. He did something with his faith. And you can continue on through there, by faith. And they followed up with an action. They obeyed. By faith, they obeyed. By faith, there's an action. Every single time. That's obedient faith. That's followed up with works. That is the perfect example. That's what we should be doing if we follow that example. When we have true faith, we're going to follow it up with action. And that's what James is talking about in James chapter 2. When we have faith, we're also going to have works with it. And we have that perfect Any questions or comments there before we move on? I, I love Hebrews chapter 11. That's, that's one of my uh, favorite chapters because we can read straight through there and every single time we see that. And that's just, that's what we need to be following. That's one of my earlier memory verses. Right. And chapter, chapter 11 verse 1 is the definition of faith yeah. and it's evidence it's evidence of God it's substance and then also we see that these people suffered for their faith they didn't just have it easy they suffered and if we're truly obeying God we're going to suffer a little bit it's not an easy walk I've seen on the face of Abraham Isaac also had that Isaac did have to have faith. He had faith not only in God, but he had faith in his father. Yeah. And that takes some true faith right there. He, he believed that uh, Abraham knew what he was doing. He trusted. So, one thing too in James is we're not saved by faith only. It's not just faith. Like we said, we've got those works along with it. And we have that denominational practice and belief that we are saved by faith only. Most of us know what that belief is, and that's called Calvinism. Calvinism, one of its tenets is faith only. And we know from James chapter 2 that, that the only place we find the words faith only together, that the Bible teaches that we are not saved by faith only. And so... Uh, this doctrine of man is specifically taught against in the Bible. And uh, we already looked at that verse, that we are not saved by faith only. Um, verse 17 even says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. We have that one. Um, but then uh, specifically, um, which one is verse 24 you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So we are not by faith, saved by faith only, but we also have to obey. Uh, Luke 17 and verse 10, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So when we've done everything that God has told us to do, we should say that we are just unprofitable servants. We haven't earned anything. We've only done what God has told us to do. Uh, that's what some critics of uh, the church say, is that, well, you're just teaching um, earned salvation. Well, no, that's not what we're teaching. Uh, we're just teaching what the Bible teaches. And the Bible says that we have to have works with faith and Christian, that is to hear the word, to 
believe that Jesus is the Son of God. James, or uh, Romans, tells us that we not only believe that he's the Son of God, but that he was raised from the dead also. We have to repent of our sins. We confess him before man. And we're baptized, arising to walk in newness of life. But just because we do those things doesn't mean that we've earned anything. Those were what we've been commanded to do. And live faithful unto death. And as we've studied before, that doesn't just mean that we live faithful all the way until our time of death. But if we are persecuted to the point that we might be killed also, because that would, that's what was happening to those Christians in Revelation 2 and verse 10. There was a time, there would be coming a time that they might be held at night point or, uh, or sword pointed in that case. Um, their lives might be threatened. And there might come a time where our lives might be threatened as well. And we need to be faithful unto them. Um, what I think about there is the girl of Columbine had a gun held to her head. Do you believe in Jesus? And if that ever happens to us, you got to think about it. If that person is holding a gun to our head, it doesn't matter if we say yes or no. They're probably at the point that they're probably going to shoot us no matter what. So we truly have to be ready to confess Jesus. That's, that's what I believe. It doesn't matter if they're asking for our confession of faith or if they're saying something about our family. Uh, you know, say this or do this or I'm going to shoot this person. We might as well just do it. If they've got a gun held to our head, they're probably at that point that they're ready to shoot. So that's what I think. Any questions or comments? It is a, it's a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. So our faith in God better be strong. So, and that time is coming. We're, we're in a rough world right now already. All right, the relation of faith and works. We've already looked at two types of faith. There's either living faith or dead faith. We better have some living faith. Uh, but the writer here reminds us that there are four types of works that are talked about, or at least four types of works that are discussed in the Bible, um, and only one of them is good. There are works of the flesh. These are unrighteous works of sin. We have several listed throughout the New Testament. Romans 1, 29-32, Galatians 5, 19-21. Colossians 3, 5 through 6. These are just a few lists of sins that are mentioned, and these are works of the flesh. In every instance, they are condemned. In fact, in Galatians 5, 21, Paul says, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We're not, it, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the kingdom being the church or the kingdom being heaven. If we commit these types of sins and we live in these sins, sin cannot get us into heaven. And if we are living in sin, how can we truly enter the church and be obedient to the gospel in our hands of the church? Because we're not truly repenting of our sins if we're going to continue to live in those sins to become a Christian. We're not truly being obedient to the gospel if we're not repenting. Now, that comes down to the individual heart. I'm not trying to judge anybody, but uh, if we're not entering into the church, if we're not entering into the kingdom, if we're not truly repenting. Uh, our own works, works practiced by men hoping to save themselves by their own power and without God. This includes idol worship, the use of mechanical instruments in worship, partaking of the Lord's Supper on a day that is not the first day of the week. Uh, 2 Timothy 
1 and verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Uh, so we do have denominations that try to do things by their own ways and go against God. Uh, we've got uh, choir groups, uh, we've got instrumental music, we've got uh, worshiping on a day that's not authorized by God, all kinds of things. And so we've got works that are practiced not according to his will of God. That is by the works of Works of the Law of Moses. So this is where we've studied the Old Testament already. And the Old Testament was fulfilled. That means we're not under the Old Law anymore. We don't need to be doing the works of the Old Law. Christ died on the cross for a reason. That was put away. Galatians 2 and verse 16. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 5 and verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now there he's specifically talking about trying to apply circumcision. But this could be any part of the old law, not just circumcision. And so works of the old law. And then we finally have works of obedience. These are acts of obedience to the gospel of Christ. In other words, becoming a Christian and remaining a Christian. Without these works, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Any questions or comments on the works? disobedience and these we probably all know about these are by doing things that have been strictly forbidden or uh, expressly forbidden by God and these are the obvious things Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of the tree of the of knowledge of good and evil Genesis 2:17 and the same is true in the New Testament Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the list of the works of the fruits of the flesh that Paul listed off. Then we have by failing to do what God has commanded, James 4, 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Um, the writer of our lesson uses Ammon as an example, uh, Ammon the leper, and so... Some things are too simple for people. And baptism is one of those. God commanded baptism. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next lesson. But uh, some things are just too simple. And we'll talk about the wisdom of the world compared to the wisdom of God. Uh, and then the third one is by acting without God's authority. This is where when the Bible is silent, we should be silent. We don't go beyond what the Bible says. And this is expressed in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We go beyond God's authority. So we should always remember uh, to only say what the Bible says and, or speak where the Bible speaks and be silent. Anything else on lesson four with faith and works? Okay. Well, let's move on to lesson five, and we'll try to cover the quizzes at the end. Okay, becoming a Christian, and most of us know how this one works, so... Christian is probably 
one of the most loosely and misused English words. And that is so true. Um, I had a history teacher in college. I don't remember exactly what the assignment was, but I had used the, the word Christian and wrote it out expressly of using it in the term of the way the Bible uses it. And he gave me a B on the assignment. And at the bottom, he put in quotation, Christian, and said that Christian was an umbrella term. And that's all he wrote on the paper. That was it. And so I went to him and I asked him, this is the only comment you put on here. Is this the reason that I got a B? And this guy was a Baptist preacher. And he grabbed my paper without any discussion, and he put a 90 on the paper and gave it back to me. And I said, that's all you want to do? You don't even want to talk about it? You don't want to tell me why? Because he just didn't want to argue. I don't know if he was truly pricked in his heart. I think he just didn't want to discuss it. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's very misused, very loosely. Uh, right. And like the writer said, anybody from someone just doing very nice works all the way up to the Bible definition of somebody who actually obeys God the way that we're supposed to. Um, just way used incorrectly. Um, so we have to make sure, like we said before, speak where the Bible speaks. And when we are doing exactly what the Bible says, that's when we're using the term correctly. We have to be obedient. And it doesn't matter what the world says. We need to teach. But it doesn't matter what the world says. We need to do what we're supposed to do. We need to make sure we don't fall in and <coughs> go in line with other because what is always popular isn't always right. And what is always right isn't always popular. And remember that. If you look at the Bible, the majority, most of the time, is the one that's wrong. Noah, the flood. You can go on and on through the Bible stories and accounts, and the majority sure have all those wrong. Yep. That is true. The majority is going to be wrong. Very few are going to be right. And the very few that are right is going to be looked down on. And it's going to be persecuted. So we have to be strong. Strong in the Lord. So uh, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, and most of us know this, but that not everyone that calls him Lord is going to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that just shows how few. Uh, we could look at uh, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, I think I got that one, that one right. Uh, the, about the narrow gate, the narrow path, and the broadway. Uh, and how many are going to go on that broadway? There's a lot of people that are going to be walking towards destruction. And very few are going to be on that narrow way. Okay. So, acts of obedience. God, as we've already discussed in the last lesson, does save us through grace. His grace is what brought us Jesus and allowed Jesus to die on the cross. But the only way that we access that grace is through obedience. He has always required obedience. From Adam and Eve all the way up to now. Uh, we've read this verse before, but let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to look at uh, verses 8 and 9. It says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. This is Jesus, of course. Uh, son is capitalized. By the things which he suffered... And verse 9 is important here. And being made perfect or complete, 
he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Again, God's grace, God's salvation is open to all, but notice the end of that, who obey him. We have to obey. God has required obedience from the very beginning. And the salvation that Jesus brought is only open to those who obey. It's not open to just anybody who believes. It's open to all who believe or who obey. Now let's look at 1 Peter in verse 4. Or chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm sorry. And beginning in verse 16. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So it's going to begin at the house of God. And if it begins at the house of God, what will the end of them that obey not the gospel of God be like? And so even the righteous, righteous will scarcely be saved. Because there are going to be some who have obeyed the gospel that will still fall away. Jesus said, if you love, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. And he said in verse 23 of chapter 14, if a man love me, he will keep my words. If we truly love God, if we truly love Jesus, we will obey him. And we can put this in an earthly aspect. If we truly love our parents, we'll obey them. If we truly love God, we're going to obey them. So we have examples of obedience or conversion in the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts is a history of the church. But what is the church? The church is a prepared place. Or, you know, it's where we are have conversion, uh, people who were converted into Christ. And so it's the history and the growing of the church. There were 3,000 new Christians added on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Uh, it only grew even more after that. So Luke recorded specific conversions through the Holy Spirit to give us examples of how to become a Christian. And that way we know how to do it and how the Holy Spirit, how God wants us to do that. Um, and different conversions show us different things. For example, Paul's conversion uh, doesn't mention everything. We have faith and baptism. I like the chart that the author of this lesson gives us. Because with the conversions that are mentioned in Acts, he shows us exactly what is offered or what is mentioned. And so with Saul or Paul's conversion, we see that only hearing is mentioned and only baptism is mentioned. But we can logically, as we've mentioned before, imply through the scriptures and through context that he had faith. He was confronted by Jesus. So we know that he had faith. We know that he believed in Jesus. Uh, we know that he was repentant because he was praying when Ananias found him. And we know that he confessed his sins because he was praying. And we also know that he was repentant uh, because of the things that he did afterwards. Is that all? Right. He brought forth those.
those fruits, fruits mean more repentance. Exactly. And so each one of these people were at a different point in their conversion. And so not every single time that Luke needs to record every single step. Uh, but every single one we have hearing recorded and we have baptism recorded. And it's important that baptism is recorded on every single one because baptism is essential in converting. Every single one of these is essential, but especially baptism. Uh, one of the things that's important to point out with uh, Paul's baptism, also with the Philippian jailer, but especially Paul's baptism, Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias told him, And why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. This lets us know that baptism is something that uh, should be done immediately. And as we've discussed before, the person who is being baptized has to be willing to be baptized because we're submitting to baptism. But Ananias is letting him know it should be done right away. And the Philippian jailer, that example, they were baptized that very hour, right away. So we see exactly what was mentioned in each of these conversions. And so we know that we have hearing the gospel. Romans 10, 17, so that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So hearing is mentioned. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we already mentioned, and also in Romans 10, we don't just believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but that he was also raised from the dead. Paul gets a lot into uh, resurrection of the dead in his letters. Uh, the third one is repenting of our sins. Four, confess our faith. We don't confess our sins like the Catholics teach, but we confess our faith uh, before people. And this is very important. We have to make our confession before others. And this is something that we don't just do once. When we're converted, what we continue to do, because everybody has to know that we believe, we have to continue to confess. And then, uh, fifth, we're buried in baptism. It is a full immersion for the remission of our sins, and we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit on immersion. Uh, arising to walk in newness of life, being faithful unto death. Again, not just till we die. But also possibly to the point of death, if we are confronted with death. Hearing and faith, uh, uh, I said faith, hearing and baptism are the only ones that are mentioned in all the examples. And we are about out of time. So, uh, let us finish this up next week, and we'll look at the uh, quiz answers next week, and we'll also cover Lesson 6. So, any questions or comments uh, to wrap this up? Okay. i tell you what, we'll completely wrap up Lesson 4 while we still have time by looking at the quiz answers, and then we'll finish up Lesson 5 and cover Lesson 6 next week. So, Lesson 4 quiz. <coughs> Uh, so we're going to fill in uh, or answer these questions here. By faith, he offered his son to God. Who did that? Abraham did that. He was cured of leprosy when he dipped in the Jordan. Naaman, correct. Uh, he said, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. This was Moses through God, of course. Um, so Moses said that. Uh, number four, he accused the Jews on the day of Pentecost of murdering Jesus. Peter, and of course we know that the other apostles were preaching as well, but Peter's sermon is recorded. He said that teaching the commandments of men for doctrine makes worship vain. 
This is Paul. Thank you. 